I love your cakes, by the way. I can't remember the last time I had one, but it was that it was fantastic. I remember you did ones in Carabas, didn't you, in the, the cafe there? That was one of the big pulls. Got to go and get Margaret's cakes. <laughs> well, it's good to be with you again this morning. And um, uh, just thank you, too, also for your prayers um, for us and uh, your support for us as well, Christian Heritage Edinburgh. We really, really appreciate that. And... Um, uh, thank you too for your, your prayers as I'm battling with health issues as well, um, I think some of you know. So thank you. Do continue to pray uh, for, for me in that as well. And um, I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to bring scripture to us this morning. Father, I thank and praise you Lord that you are the only saviour. Apart from you there is no saviour. Thank you Lord that when we look and we see the starting this beginning of this year, and um, Lord, we look and we see what's going on in Israel. We see what's going on in Ukraine. We see other things uh, kind of lurking around in the shadows um, and things, all sorts of things. Uh, and Lord, if we had no hope, uh, we would look and that this, without you, we'd have no hope. But with you, Lord, there is a certain hope. Mm -hmm. We have assurance. We have an anchor in the storms of life. And we know, Lord, our, our destiny in you, Lord. We know salvation in Christ. And uh, Father, I just pray this morning as I bring this message that you would search our hearts and that you would speak to our spirits and that we would engage with you and we'd hear what your spirit is saying to our hearts mm -hmm. today. Whether we know you, Lord, and do have that security in Christ, we do have that anchor mm -hmm. for our souls. I pray, Father, we be encouraged and strengthened and challenged. If uh, we don't have that anchor for our souls yet, I pray that today will be the day when the anchor will be cast and the anchor will be secured in Christ alone. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Um, um, bring a scripture here from Matthew chapter um, 16. That's interesting. Just recent, just before this, we had a few chapters earlier on. That was chapter Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 it wasn't planned at all. <laughs> a few chapters later on, we got Matthew 16. And I'm, I'm beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist some elijah and others jeremiah or one of the prophets he said to them but who do you say that i am simon peter answered and said you are the christ the son of the living god jesus answered and said to him blessed are, are you simon bar jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father who is in heaven and i also say to you that you are peter and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, be from you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. And he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
What a powerful passage. Absolutely amazing. It's absolutely <coughs> chock a block with so many things I could bring this morning, but it'll probably be go on all day. There's so much to pick out of this. Uh, it's absolutely rich in challenges and inspiration uh, from the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to particularly focus on this um, title I've given my talk is Who Do You Say I Am? Now you're a Christian straight away, of course we know who Jesus is, he's the Son of God. Yes, but let's follow that one through. And um, But before we even look at and begin to unpack some of this, I want to just um, focus, first of all, the context of what's happening here and the place of where the action's happening, this conversation's going on. So the first thing is, the context of this, what you've had just before then, you've had two incredible, miraculous things have happened. Jesus has fed the 5,000, which is five loaves and two fishes. Think about that, that's extraordinary. Multiplication of bread and, and fish, demonstrating who he is, that he's God. And then, that's followed on very quickly afterwards, is the same thing, but this time 4,000 people and seven loaves and a few fish. And uh, these two great miracles that happen, this is following up, by the way, from a whole load of other miracles and signs and wonders that have happened before then. And then just before, just the beginning of this chapter, it says that the Pharisees and Sadducees came and tested him, saying, and asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. You think, this is absolutely crazy. There's so, there are so many signs and so many wonders. Can't people see it as clearly as anything who Jesus is? And yet, these Pharisees and Sadducees are saying, give us a sign to show us who you are. You think, oh, for goodness sake, <laughs> don't you get it? But you know, we can be just like that. We can so e be easy to throw the stone at the, those ones, but we can be just as blind sometimes. We can have blind spots ourselves. And Jesus called the Pharisees blind Pharisees. So um, that's the context of it. And then he gives a bit of a preaching about the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the teaching of those, beware of those. And so then we're in this bit now. They're, they travel and they're coming to this place uh, called Caesarea uh, Philippi. And that's where this great question comes, or two questions in fact, who do men say that I am the son of man am? And the second question, but who do you say that I am? So, interesting thing is, uh, it's interesting, when you look at the Bible very carefully, sometimes we skim over things. Sometimes we can even, in our church traditions, or things we've picked up many, many years ago, we just assume. I mean, a classic case of that is, we might sing that carol, We Three Kings of Orient are. Is that biblical? Anyone think that biblical? Why is that not biblical? We don't know how many. We don't know how many there were, there were three gifts, but we don't know how many were, and were they kings? No, no they were major, they were wise men. <laughs> and just one example I throw out to you, that so often there are things we can even take in and we just, without even thinking about it. So here I, I can remember, uh, I read years ago, oh Jesus who's standing right outside this place, it's a cave, and uh, maybe some of you have been to Israel, you, up in the north part of Israel, you've been to that spot. I, we were in, there in Israel in May, we didn't get a chance to go there. But there's this, this cave there, which is quite extraordinary. It's very lush, very green area. The water pours out from near that cave. And it's the, the kind of the fountains that form the Jordan River. And uh, so it's a beautiful, green, lovely spot. Um, and with that, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff, the paganism, the niches where they place the gods and the rocks behind. And a particular cave uh, was dedicated to fertility gods. So that's the kind of place, and I, I was, I'd read things earlier on when I was a younger Christian. Jesus stood right outside there, and that's where he's asking his question, right next to the cave. And, um, but um, that was my assumption, and tour guides will take you there in Israel, and they'll say the same thing. But actually, what does the Bible say? It says uh, in Matthew 16, the region of Caesarea Philippi, that's one thing. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, says, on the road, this is where he's, he's discussing with disciples on the road in uh, Mark chapter 8, on the way to these towns or these villages, which includes Caesarea Philippi. And then Luke chapter 9 says he was praying alone, and then the disciples came to him, and then they, uh, he had a discussion with them. So here's an interesting thing. We can actually read the scriptures many times over even, and we can have an idea in our heads that's being put there that isn't necessarily accurate. 
So to, to, to test things, everything by the word of God. It could be that he was standing right outside the cave, but we don't know, but he was certainly very close to that area. Now today, there's, um, the town is actually called Benias. It's not called Caesar or Philippi at all. And um, it's on the, mo the, the modern highway 99 in Israel. So that's a main road. It would have been a main road anyway. And that's where Jesus with his disciples would have gone, which does end up in what was called Caesar and Philippi in those days. But um, what's the backdrop to this? Well, you've got long, long before, centuries and centuries before Jesus was in the area, the Canaanites, they were worshipping a god called Baal. That was a fertility god. And you often read that in the Old Testament about the Baals and all that sort of thing. Um, so they, this cave where the water was has seemed very important to be a symbol of fertility. <coughs> With it went a lot of sexual immorality and debauchery that accompanied the fertility gods. So that was the first thing. Later on the Greeks have an influence there and they introduced the god Pan. And the god Pan, that's where you get the word panic from, for example. When people get into panic, you know, like they're in the dark or something, they're scared or whatever. It's, they believe the god Pan causes that. Um, and you get the word pantheism, nature, that everything is God, okay? So they're the kind of words we're familiar with uh, concerning the god Pan. He was depicted like a man with goat's uh, legs um, playing his, um, his pan pipes. And that's where you get your Peter Pan influence. Sorry, by the way, I'm a Scottish writer, J.M. Barry, but that's the influence of Peter Pan coming from there. Um, and, um, but you've also, what happens is, Herod the Great, he comes along and he builds in this town, what, uh, which was called Panius, named after the god Pan, he builds the Augustinium, which is a temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus. Now, Caesar Augustus, of course, Jesus was born at the time of Caesar Augustus. So what happens is this, he's, he's deified, he's turned into a god, Augustus Caesar. Uh, and um, this temple was built in 19 BC right in front of the cave of Pan. So you've got this introduction of more pagan gods coming into the situation. And other pagan temples dedicated to other pagan gods are there. So it's a real stronghold in Israel of paganism. That's what's happening. A um, bit later on, you've got uh, Herod's brother Philip. He rebuilt the town of Panaeus and he dedicated to Tiberius Caesar, who also was deified and became a god in the Roman world. And he dedicated to Tiberius Caesar and himself. That's why it was called Caesarea, that's Caesar, Philippi, Philip, uh, the brother of Herod. And that became the base of Philip uh, right up until 33 AD. He had coins struck with the god Pan uh, in the currency at the time there. So this is your backdrop to what's going on here, even before we start to speak about um, the message here. So the first question is this. Disciples in this area, they're saying, uh, well, Jesus asked them the first question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he's, he's want, after all these big miracles, all these things are being happening, he's asking the disciples themselves, I think he knows anyway, but he's asking them, what, do you, what are the people saying about me? Well, they said, uh, some of them reckon that you're you know, John the ba Baptist, that's a strange thing to say. Some say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's a general consensus of the crowd, despite the miracles and the things that Jesus has been preaching, doing amongst them, okay? So you think, why on earth John the Baptist? I mean, he'd been beheaded. If you go back just only uh, a couple of chapters, chapter 14, John the Baptist had been beheaded in a most cruel way. Um, and uh, why? The reason why is because Herod has, um, in a relationship with uh, uh, Herodias, who's the wife of his brother Philip, so it's, it's against Jewish law, it's against God's law to do that, but it's still alive. So um, John the Baptist being a prophet, he confronts Herod, he rebukes him. Herod's really cross about that, but Herodias is absolutely fuming. So when, when Herodias' daughter is dancing, and there must have been a lot of drink flying around as well. Uh, oh, you can have whatever you want kind of thing. And um, so she, the, the daughter, she goes back and she, she asks her mum, Herodias, what shall I ask? Ah, oh, John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's pretty gruesome, isn't it? So Herod actually 
bothered about this because he's bothered the, the John the Baptist as a prophet. But he goes ahead and does it. They chop off John the Baptist's head, bring it on a plate, and present it to Herod. Pretty awful. People, uh, the people who love John the Baptist, they're grieving his death, his death, uh, very much. <coughs> so that's the backdrop. Herod, you read in the Gospels, was so bothered by what happened that Jesus is doing miracles. He thinks that John the Baptist has come back again. He's been raised from the dead. Somehow his head <laughs> and his body have come together. He's come out the grave. And it's like revenge time. It's like he's haunted, he's tormented by this thing. I think it's John the Baptist. It's God's judgment against me. There's that kind of thinking behind it. That's why a lot of people, it sounds crazy at first, but if you get the background of it, you begin to understand why some people are saying, Jesus is John the Baptist. And come back, even though John the Baptist never did any miracles actually, it's Jesus doing the miracles all the time um, and then the others think well, Elijah well why Elijah? well because the Jewish people expected that Elijah would come before the coming of the Messiah and um, because most people hadn't understood that Jesus was the Messiah they had a problem, John, uh, Jesus had said, John the Baptist is Elijah if you receive that or accept that um, he says he, the Bible says he came in the spirit and power of Elijah and he was turning the hearts of the fathers to the children the children to the fathers uh, as it, the prophecy says in prophet Malachi so that was a ministry of John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah Jesus so they don't get it that this is John the Baptist again so there are some don't, ha don't get that revelation on it so that's that lot and then you get uh, other ones are saying well Jeremiah, which is a strange one again, because Jeremiah didn't do any miracles either. He was a prophet uh, that God used uh, very powerfully. And then one of the prophets, well that's a good guess of course, it could be the great prophet in Deuteronomy 18 that was promised a prophet like Moses, because Moses by the hand of God did many miracles. So that this is the backdrop to the Jewish thinking, okay? But apart from that, you've got this whole area which has become paganized. It's a real stronghold of paganism. You have the god Pan. So Jesus is saying, on top of this, who do, you, uh, who do the people say that I am? The, they're giving the Jewish feedback. But what about the pagans in the era? What are they? The people have been paganized. Well, maybe he's one of the gods, you know. Um, and uh, you've got this worship of Pan and Baal uh, and various other pagan gods. So you've got that also in the background in the situation. Question is today, what do the crowd think about who Jesus is today? Well, mostly in our culture, we're not Jewish background. Um, and uh, it, it's actually really quite shocking. Um, the young people coming through, and we, we do a street cafe, which is one of the things we do to reach people with the gospel in key busy places. <coughs> And outside where the St. James Shopping Centre uh, is, is a very great, a really good spot for reaching local, particularly Scottish people. And the young ones, they're actually really were open and so many of them don't have the first clue about Christianity. They really don't. I mean, there are young people growing up in Scotland now who've never even heard of Jesus. The, well, the only time they've ever heard about Jesus is a swear word. That's all they know. Um, it's a shocking state of uh, that we find ourselves in Scotland today. So they're most, a lot of them wouldn't have a clue or very little. So um, Jewish people obviously today, would, most, most of them would see that Jesus is a false messiah. We have the rise of Islam that increasingly hits our headlines over and over and over and over again. They regard Jesus just as a prophet, no more. He's a great prophet. Uh, Muhammad is even better. And, um, but certainly not the Messiah. They call him the Messiah, but certainly not the Son of God. And that, in their viewpoint, that's blasphemy. To say that Jesus is God, he's the Son of God, you can be killed for that. In fact, if a Muslim turns away from Islam, the Quran itself says you should kill him. So even your family should be responsible for killing your daughter or son if he believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how serious it is. That's the spirit of Antichrist. So that's, that's the kind of situation we're dealing with uh, there. So you've got the Muslims believe that Jesus is just a prophet of Islam. 
and he wants to make us all Muslims. They believe that when Jesus comes back, he'll destroy all the crosses and make us all Muslims. All of you lot, all of us, we be get converted to Islam. So, um, then you've got other people. What do they think about Jesus? Well, he's very popular amongst the New Age people. New Age people, they mix all the religions together. They're a bit like the pagan people there in the cave of Pan and God's pantheism, God's everything, we're all part of God. There are many ways to God, all that sort of thing. Um, Jesus just becomes one of the teachers amongst many other teachers. So it's very arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way to God. There, is, there are many ways that you choose and pick and choose whichever you want, whatever, whichever suits you. It's like a spiritual supermarket you go into. Oh, I have that Heinz baked beans. No, I won't. I changed my mind. I'm actually going to go for the reduced one, the co-op baked beans or the Tesco baked beans or the bottom shelf or whatever it is. And I'll, and I'll choose, pick and choose whatever I want that suits me because really I'm ultimately God. That's the kind of attitude of the new age. In fact, we, we baptised, uh, well, somebody was baptised, somebody who came to Christ in our house just last year, a German young girl, the 27th, and she was, she'd gone right down the new age path. She got to a place where she actually believed she was God, because that's the ultimate of new age. That's where it leads to complete blasphemy. And when she came to Christ, it's one of those, she actually broke down in tears, and she wept and wept because she realised this horrendous position of sin she got herself into. But then she found the grace and the forgiveness of Christ was so beautiful and her life's been transformed ever since. Um, so that, that, that's the situation we find ourselves in today. And you've got, of course, Hindus. They're quite happy to have Jesus on the mantelpiece along with Krishna and uh, Kali and, well, not necessarily Kali, Krishna and Vishnu and various other ones. They'll put Jesus along with them. Um, and that will be a popular thing these days. The atheists, of course, they don't believe Jesus is God or anything like that. They think if he existed at all, he was just a good moral teacher. Well, in some, some respects, because they reject some of his moral teaching, uh, whichever suits them. And so what you've got, that's our modern situation when we go outside. You probably don't get many Muslims here in, in well, I don't know, perhaps you do get more Muslims, probably some coming in on our estate where we live in Newton Grange outside Edinburgh, increasing, I think we've got about four Muslim families now. So increasingly it's, it's pouring out. You go to Edinburgh, you reach people in street cafe, uh, you, you could talk to a Muslim, a Buddhist, a New Age pagan, an atheist. It's becoming like London, um, a very similar situation in Edinburgh, in the, right in the, the town. So that's our situation. So that, that's the kind of things that people are thinking these days. But the question that Jesus asked, the second question is this, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? Now, as I said earlier, as Christians, immediately we get the same understanding as Peter. You know, ah, oh, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. We understand that. Um, but probably virtually all of you would say that and agree with that. But have you really come to know the Lord as, your, as the Son of God, as the Saviour? That's the thing. Or if, if you do understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, what difference does it make in our lives? If that really is true, what does it really uh, mean for us? Well, what happens is, he asks, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And you're quite correct, you can have people who have all their lives, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, they've been even in really good, solid gospel preaching churches. Oh, it's the gospel bit again, bing. They kind of switch off, I don't know what happens. But they go through for years and years and years. And uh, they're lost for eternity because they never gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They had a form of Christianity, what you call churchianity, which is the word I often use, a churchianity. They're churchians, not Christians. And um, that's, the, that's the thing. And right into this, this message, uh, it comes from the revelation of our Heavenly Father. You see, the Heavenly Father has revealed this to, to Peter. It's not Peter just on his own. I'm a very clever guy, I've, I've worked it out is the Heavenly Father has revealed it to Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And he understands not just 
in his head, but he's got it in his heart. He's taken hold of that, despite his faults and weaknesses. And Peter was kind of one of those guys that he's all, oh, yeah, Jesus, uh, and he, he, he blows it. And then, you know, he's denying Jesus. And he's saying, I'll never deny you. And they, all the rest said the same thing. And then he denies him three times. And that's Peter, you know? And maybe you're one of those kind of people that's like this, very, very enthusiastic and can blow it sometimes. But God takes him, uh, Peter, and, and you know he's got this revelation. And then he goes on and says that, I also say to you, Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Now that's an amazing thing. Does it mean that the whole weight of the church is on Peter? <laughs> no, it's not, is it? Look a bit further on, and what happens? First of all, Jesus is really excited. Peter, you've got this revelation. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God from the Heavenly Father. That's fantastic. And then, what do we find only just uh, a few verses later in 21? From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter talk, took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan! You are an offence to me. Uh, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. <clears throat> so what's Peter's happening? He's gone for this great revelation. This, wow, Jesus, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Well done, Peter. You got it right. That was from God. And then suddenly, no, you're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to die. I'm not going to let it happen. And all this sort of thing. And then Jesus rebukes him. Get behind me, Satan. Well, you're an offence to me. Because he's thinking worldly thinking, he's not thinking heavenly thinking, he's not in line with God's thoughts at that time. So, you've got Peter, he's so unstable. <clears throat> yes, you've got it right, and then now you've blown it, Peter. So how on earth are you going to build a church <coughs> on somebody like that? Of course, he's a human being, he's a sinner who's saved by Jesus, the same as us who've come to know Jesus. And there's no way God's going to build on you and me. <laughs> So what's the rock he's talking about? It's not Peter and the lions of the popes and all that sort of thing. This is, um, Jesus himself is the rock of our salvation. And it's the confession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That's the thing. As we take that by faith and receive that, that's the thing that God, uh, Jesus will build his church. And it doesn't matter what uh, is thrown against it, what a storm is thrown at it, persecution, hatred, rejection, or whatever happens, the enemy has different techniques over the centuries. He'll use different things, he'll cause church splits, he'll cause uh, a wrong teaching to come somewhere, persecution, materialism, popularity with the country. Oh, the Christians, they're the best things, they're the, they're the kind of the new um, celebrities or something. Any of those things, great temptation of pride can come that way. So the enemy has certain techniques he uses through the centuries. But Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now he says, I will build my church. Not your church, not my church, not an, even a church denomination. He never said, I will build the uh, Anglican <coughs> church. He never said, I will build the Presbyterian church. He never said, I will build the Brethren church or the Evangelical Free Church. He said, I will build my church. And that is a very important thing. Because if you look at what's been going on since the pandemic, increasingly things are being shaken. And we're moving into more and more shaking that's going globally in all areas of life. And so with all the shaking that's going on, systems are changing. We're in all change. It's like when you go to <laughs> it's like one of those stations in London. All change. And it's, um, it's like that. And that's a phase we're in now in Britain and the world. Uh, it's like that. And, um, and in this, this big change that's happening is that, uh, that God the Father, Heavenly Father is doing some pruning. If you read John 15, he prunes away the branches which don't bear fruit. He cuts them off, throws them in the fire, they're burnt off. The ones which are producing fruit, he prunes them to make them even better. They're more fruitful. We are, the church globally is going through a pruning time. There is only one church, the body of Christ, all the believers. 
There might be brethren, there might be Baptist, there might be Pentecostal, there might be Anglican, whatever. If they know the Lord Jesus truly in their hearts, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and that is the thing. Uh, when we're rooted in that, that's the anchor. When we know that, whatever storms we face, um, we know that we have an eternal kingdom that we're inheriting. All the other things will be shaken, but God's kingdom is never shaken. And that's what we're inheriting. Isn't that great news? If you're a Christian, I mean, you look at the world, if you don't know Jesus, and when we talk to students uh, through Street Cafe, and we get below all the nice bits, and then we start to ask a few questions, you dig a bit deeper. What you find is so many young people in their twenties, they are really frightened about what's going the future. They're frightened about climate change. They're frightened about Israel, how that could escalate, that it could become an Islamic Jihad, <coughs> that becomes a global conflict with the West. You've got China lurking in the background about Taiwan, looking for their opportunity. That could lead to a global con conquest. You could end up with global war. You could end up with such chaos and such unbelievable, horrendous things. Uh, and they're wondering, what, what's the point of me going to degree, get a degree, trying to get a job if I can get a job, only for the planet to be destroyed? And this hopelessness that's out there, when you dig below the surface, and we of all people, as Christians, we've got this hope, which is certain, which is unshakable in Christ. It's absolutely brilliant. No wonder the early symbol in the catacombs was a, was a simple uh, anchor. That was before the fish or anything like that. It was an anchor, about 150 AD, that was uh, inscribed in the stone work there, an anchor because Christ is that anchor for us, irrespective of what happens, he takes us through and he will build his church. That's fantastic. By the way, we, we you know, you, some, I, I, was, um, I got a, a text message from somebody who does street cafe and says, oh, we're not getting people saved all the time. It's like, you know, all you have to do is go out there and people say, oh, I need to give my life to Jesus straight away. And it's hard going. But Jesus builds his church and he does it his way. It's not down to us. So um, we do our bit by faith, but it, God does the miracle. So that's the first thing I want to really bring out um, about us Christians here. And he also goes on to say, if anyone denies, uh, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then again, for what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's the thing, as Christians. The challenge is, if we really do believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, it means that he's Lord of everything. We've got these wonderful words, Jesus Christ is Lord, there. And we can say it so glibly, yeah, Jesus Christ is Lord, we can see it, we can sing it and we know it but what does that mean in the daily life the way we do things the way we how we live how we drive our cars how we empty our rubbish how we treat our neighbors how we treat our enemies how we do things according to god's plan his kingdom his kingdom first his righteousness first and that can mean we're going the opposite way of the culture and there could be clash increasingly in scotland and we'll find that persecution and I've been saying that as I've come to the church for years, that is coming, that cloud is coming. And we need to be realizing we're in a place where we know this confidence, our Messiah, the Son of God, our, our Savior, our Lord. And we're prepared to deny ourselves, take up our crosses and come after him, even to suffer for the sake of Christ. And uh, that is um, there in the scriptures and right into this Jesus brings that message. But that's that's for the believers. But maybe today, you not even you maybe you you love the songs you're singing. Maybe you like coming along regularly on a Sunday, and you've been hearing the, the preaching and so on. But you don't yet, you don't yet have your anchor in Christ. If I was to test it a bit, like a good dentist would um, go and check check the teeth, it would be very bad if I went to my dentist. He said, "Open your mouth." And in three seconds he said, okay, you're fine, off you go. I wouldn't want to go back again. I want somebody who's going to actually probe and test uh, my teeth to make sure I'm okay. So the thing is, ask you a question. If you die tonight, would you be going to heaven? 
to be with the Christ. With Christ, that's the question I always ask, because that takes you right to the rock foundation of where you're standing. Uh, and actually, is it on the rock you're standing, Jesus Christ, or is it on the sand you're standing? If in your heart you're answering, "Well, I hope I'm going to go to heaven," if I ask you the question next, "Why do you hope?" Well, because I try and be a good person. I go to church and I try and uh, do the best I can to follow what Jesus taught. If that's your hope, you are building on the sand. You'll be lost for eternity. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment. So the person instead who knows he has Christ as his Lord and Saviour is the one who gives up on completely, I can't save myself. Self-salvation is useless. Self-righteousness is useless. Uh, it does nothing for me. It's, it's, uh, and um, the Bible even speaks about it being like filthy rags. It's just something you cast aside and say, no, I can't save myself. Instead of trusting in myself, hopefully I'll go to heaven because I'm a good person. No, I'm a sinner. The Ten Commandments shows us we have broken God's law and we are guilty before God, every single one. So you flee from trusting in yourself to the rock, Jesus Christ. That's your firm foundation, that's your anchor, that's the place to go. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, save me, I cannot save myself. And you receive his righteousness that makes you right with God. And it's a gift you receive by faith. You can't earn it by anything you can do. So um, if that's you today, don't put it off. Don't put it off. Uh, today is a day of salvation, the Bible says. And uh, God's offering you that free gift. He, he says to you to repent. That means turning away, completely away from the way you've been going, trusting yourself, and instead to trust Jesus Christ uh, for your salvation rather than your own self. So um, I'm just going to pray. Um, Father, I thank you so much for this gospel. I thank you for this good news. I thank you, Lord, that uh, even though we look in this new year of 2024, we can see all sorts of things that bother us mm. um, all around us in the world and how things, where things are being driven, uh, so many things. Uh, but at the same time, we see signs of hope because we know that you're coming back and that we're on the winning side. And what we have is not just a vague hope, I just hope so, but it's a certain hope, it's a full assurance. We know uh, to whom we belong. We have cast our anchor on you, Lord, that you are the one who holds us. And uh, we hold on to you because you first held on to us. And we thank and praise you, Lord, um, for your goodness to us. We thank you that we have eternal life, we have forgiveness of sins. You've given us the Holy Spirit to live in us. You're teaching us the way to go. And I thank you, Lord, that your grace is there with us all the way through in good and bad times. And you will take us through, you will see us through the storms of life, whatever they are, and finally we'll come home to be with you. What a wonderful place that will be. Father, I pray if anyone today is trusting in themselves, in their, what they can do, hoping to somehow get to heaven that way, Lord, I pray that they would realise, ah, oh, I've given up, I'm trying to save myself, <coughs> standing on sand, sinking sand, I'm now going to uh, repent and trust Jesus as Lord and Saviour be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I pray that if there's anybody today, today will be this day of salvation. You speak to hearts, <coughs> that they may be, be made right with you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>